bring light to the darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you lord let's sing that again you give life you give life you are love darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken and great are you Lord it's your breath it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour
In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Welcome to our online service this morning. Let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the grace, the mercy, and the hope that come. And as we begin the Advent season this week, may we understand again the light of Jesus that breaks into the darkness. May we understand the hope that comes in this difficult time of the year where there's a lot of night, but a time in which we are reminded the light is coming. So today, focus our hearts again on that light. And we say thank you for all that we have. Teach us today. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this has been an odd season of the year, and it seems pretty much every week there's updates to you know, COVID stuff. And of course, uh, this week the Premier came out uh, and gave us a little bit of a walk down uh, further information. Uh, of course, we're in a partial lockdown these days, a little bit of a reset to try to get COVID numbers under control. And how that affects us is in a couple of ways. Obviously, most of you are watching. You probably didn't come to church for Sunday morning. Uh, if you did, uh, we are, of course, welcome to come. We are just at slightly, we're one third capacity is what we're allowed, which is actually about what we've been prepared for with our socially distanced seating, so it doesn't affect us a lot. Masks now move from suggested to mandatory, and I know that's a hardship for a few people, but that is uh, part of the government decree. As well as it affects me a little bit, as I'm trying to get to know people, we've been trying to go around and, and visit people in their homes and, and get to know people there, and. So we and I kind of took a step back even a week ago from going into homes. Right now with the present government shutdown, we'll, we'll be trying to do some phone calls, but uh, unfortunately home visits seem to be out for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we try to under, we're trying to understand the government rules and let me tell you that I appreciate the many inputs and inquiries that I've had from church members uh, throughout this process. Know that your calls are welcome and your questions are welcome at any time. Um, but this does not take away from this, the first Sunday of Advent. In a few moments, we're going to come to the message and really find that this is one of those years we desperately need Advent, don't we? Isaiah chapter 9, passage many churches read at the beginning of Advent. I have always made this my habit to read this on the first Sunday of Advent. In Isaiah 9, starting in verse 1, it says this, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You've enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdened them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. 
the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish us. We do not yet have all the candles for the Advent wreath, but we do want to light the first candle today and recognize that indeed we await Jesus coming as a light in the time of darkness. Let's pray once again. Father, thank you for the grace that we see so freely in Jesus Christ. And in this time of struggle, and in this time of questions, may we understand greater how much Jesus brings to us. Father, I pray for those who need our prayers, for those who are struggling, who are sick, who are ill, who are injured, for those who are grieving. Father, this is a time of year in which some of those pains are felt more acutely. I know there's those who are watching who are thinking of specific people, perhaps in their lives, who are struggling right now. And we bring all of these thoughts, these prayer requests before you and ask for your grace and your mercy, that your love and your hope will just fill each one. We thank you that today we may know Jesus Christ. And we pray that we may know him in all parts of our lives, whether it be physically, where we need healing, emotionally, because there is grief and struggle, and maybe most importantly, spiritually, because of the struggles of this world and the sin that holds this world so tight. So, Father, as we begin Advent, we look to you and ask for the grace of Jesus Christ in a special way. We worship your holy name, and we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, have you been following the last couple of weeks in which we've been trying to get the sermons up in advance? Obviously, I'm not taping this at Heartland this week. I appreciate the work that they have done. And uh, Austin Norland has been uh, doing the video recording. You can't see him, but he's actually standing right beside me. And I appreciate the work he's doing. We're trying to do this now back here at our home church in Lamont and trying to make things feel more at home. But I appreciate uh, the opportunity that we've had to be blessed um, by the generosity at Heartland. The last couple of weeks, if you've uh, been able to view the sermons, have been about some very important defining moments in the lives of some of the kings of Israel. We certainly called it that, that last week with David. In a moment of crisis, David stops and he worships God. And then because he worships, he does the rest of the story correctly. He doesn't take the crown. He'd been promised that he would become king, and the crown is offered to him, but the crown is offered to him in an illegitimate way. He doesn't stop and take it the wrong way. It's one of a series of defining moments we've seen. Three weeks ago, Saul had a defining moment. He was the king before David. It was a defining time in his life, and he fails because he is not right with God to start the story. There are many defining moments of life for individuals, for the church. Let me ask you, is COVID one of the defining moments? I think it is. And I think there is a potential for it to lead us deeper into the things of God, just like it was for David. But because it's also one of these defining moments, it also has the threat of being more like that defining moment of Saul's. And it leads us away from the things that God has called us to. There are many divergent views within our church, within our community, within our world about how do we handle COVID? Some say we need to take it very seriously. Some, maybe not so much. Some have told me that it is critically important that we 
mask to save lives. And others have come to me and said, well, masks, all they do is create conformity. I would argue our view of masks or not wearing masks or any other debate about the disease or, or the legitimacies of how we handle COVID are not the things that define us in this present age. The question is, what defines us? Let me give you three. First, do our fears, whether they be about either the disease or the cure or, or hidden motivations of others, do they distract us from worship? Do they pull us away from really knowing God? Or do they push us to singing the praises of our Savior? My second question would be, do differing opinions lead us to disunity or unity within the church? Do I see Jesus or do I see the thing that I'm disagreeing about? 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 says, By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. It's not about what we believe in certain controversies, but how we handle those moments in which we disagree with other Christians. My third question is this. Does this moment drive us to prayer and seeking God? Or does it just increase stress and our anger against the things of this world? 1 John chapter 2, just a chapter before what I just read, in verse 17 it says, And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. To live in God, in his way, that is what matters. And it is the only way, the absolute only way in which the church can impact the world. COVID will either drive us to God or will drive us to the enemy. It is a refining moment for the church. The church has long looked like the world, just with some holy veil over it or a holy label attached to it. And I'm thinking this is one of those moments where God comes and interrupts. We come to Advent, the darkest time of the year. We have no idea when Jesus, in, the, in, what, in what part of the year Jesus was born. It might have been summer, it might have been Christmas. We don't know. But we do know the choice to celebrate Christmas at the end of December was deliberate. Coming out of the darkest season of the year when just a couple of days after the longest night of the year, just a couple of days after when light is just starting to break in on the darkness, light breaking through. When things are getting dark, that is when light and hope need to break through the most. We've been looking at Jacob and Esau and their descendants. There is a number of defining moments that come with the descendants of Jacob and Esau. Jacob, the one who gets the promise of God despite the fact he's a scoundrel because he needs a savior. And Esau, ah, he doesn't need the blessing of God. He sells it to his brother for a bowl of stew. Among the descendants, the descendants of Esau often trip up the descendants of Jacob. Saul gets careless with sin. That causes his heart to get hard. And he needs to prove that he is right. Not to be right with God, that'd be great. But to be right and prove himself to be right. A few weeks ago, we came to a similar moment with David where he makes a big blunder. 
and the sin stands in front of him. But the difference is David repents. And last week, before he even gets to the stage that he needs to repent, he comes to music, he comes to worship, and therefore is prepared for that very difficult moment. Psalm 60 is a psalm of David that is written much later in his life from the stories we've been looking at. It's written during another war with the descendants of Esau, one we don't have a lot of, of information on. I encourage you to look up and, and maybe after the fact read Psalm 60. If you read the title of it, it makes it sound like there's this great victory, but if you read the psalm itself, it almost sounds like defeat, like they've been struck down by the enemy. In 60 verse 8, it says this, Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Now that's put in the mouth of God. This doesn't sound so bad to us. I cast my shoe. But that was about the worst, nastiest insult that could be thrown around in Israel in the ancient times. This was meant to say, here is the worst. God, you've condemned these ones. And look, once again, they're pulling us away from you. Are you awake, God? Are you paying attention? Can't you deal with the sons of Esau? And the response really is David has given a number of these defining moments. Hard moments that should drive us to Jesus. Two or three times in this series, I've quoted a book uh, by a man named Ian Thomas called The Saving Life of Christ. And I've said it's, there's a couple of chapters in there that deal with Esau and his descendants that kind of inspired me to preach this sermon. And he, he looks at a passage in Malachi 1 that we've come to a few times in which God says he hated Esau. And our author writes this, why did God hate Esau? Because God can do absolutely nothing with a man who will not admit that he needs anything from God. Esau rejected God's means of grace. He repudiated man's need of God's intervention. He despised his birthright. And God never forgave him. This is the basic attitude of sin. It makes God irrelevant to the stern business of living. Catch that. He doesn't say this is a basic attitude of sin, that we reject him or ignore him. It's that life gets in the way and he becomes irrelevant to us. It gives to man a flattering sense of self importance. God can do nothing for the man eaten up with the spirit of Esau. The sad thing is that even a Christian may be so impressed with himself and with his own ability that even though he gives lip service to the fact, he may still see no personal relevance in the indwelling presence of Christ. It will smack him a mysticism. He will consider such teaching to be exaggerated, exaggeratedly subjective, and will pride himself on being a practical man of action. And thus he too may despise his birthright. Light, breaking in to hard times. God looking to break through into the lives of the people of the church so that we may be an impact on a world that desperately needs it. If we are not sold out to God fully, then all we do is turn the world against the church because we are completely incapable of fixing the world. Only Jesus can do it. So our dark world does not need self-righteous Christians 
who know they are good enough, but a church of repentant sinners who are desperately in need of a Savior each and every minute of their life. Maybe COVID is meant to look a lot like Advent. A dark moment, but when where light is begging to flood through. Being good enough is not good enough. We need desperately to cling to Jesus. We're going to jump ahead in the Old Testament to a man named Amaziah. And I have bad news. He lets the work of Esau affect him in the same way that King Saul did. And unfortunately, we've seen his story before. One who starts good, but he gets derailed. And this king is going to let a defining moment of his life be his downfall. Amaziah. His dad was named Joash. He was a bad king. And he goes to battle. He loses in battle. And, and that becomes his downfall. He ends up being assassinated by some of his followers. And his son Amaziah becomes the king. He takes over. He's a better king. Kind of a subjective statement, isn't it? He's better than bad. He's better than the alternative. We're mostly going to be looking at 2 Corinthians 25. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to kind of follow along as I, as I tell a little bit of the story. He deals with his dad's assassins, but he shows great restraint and does not make it worse. He uses scripture as a guideline for how he handles it and that restrains the reaction that's coming from his grief. And so he keeps a full-out civil war from occurring. I'm sure he's listening to a bunch of his advisors who are saying, Do you know what? If they did this to your dad, you got to go wipe out all their relatives. you got to attack everybody who's at all involved with anybody who was part of the assassination. You may remember the, the 1980s movie, The Untouchables. And there's a line in there that the, the recently uh, deceased Sean Connery gives in that movie in which he says, if they send one of yours to the hospital, you need to send one of theirs to the morgue. In other words, blow it up, expand it. Hit them back worse than they hit you. He doesn't do it. He restrains because the Bible tells him to restrain. He develops a bit of an army. He was ready to flex his muscle. The people of God, the Jewish people, are divided at this point in time. He's the king of the southern kingdom. There's a northern kingdom. They usually don't get along, but at this moment, the northern kingdom says, Messiah, we've got an army. I'll tell you what. We want to go to war. You come join us. Not only can you take all the plunder you get, we'll pay all your expenses. And they send him down a whole bunch of loot. And he looks over and he's drooling over and he thinks, man, economically, this can change everything for our kingdom. And a prophet of God walks in. I give it his name. And he says, God does not want you to go. Don't go. And I'm going to tell you, he's torn. But he does what's right. He listens to the prophet. He sends the money back to the northern kingdom. He doesn't attack. He ends up making an enemy that day. But he follows God. He does, in a whole bunch of years, kind of get crunched into a couple of verses. But he continues to expand his army, let some go, bring some more in. Eventually goes to attack, this time Edom, on his southern flank children of Esau. There being a problem. He attacks. He wins a huge victory. As happens in war in those days, you would go and you would, you would get the spoils of war, including a whole bunch of little idols, the gods of Edom. And Amaziah did what was expected of an ancient king. He offered sacrifices to the idols. You did that because the idea was you defeated your enemy. 
Then you offered a gift to their gods and then their gods kind of came on your side and maybe their gods would help you. Later in history, the Romans became artists at this. They always adopted everybody else's gods. Edom knew the one true God, but they also worship other idols, particularly God by the name of Kos. And typical of that era, Amaziah, who knew better, started to offer in sacrifice to this God. Once again, this prophet, this unnamed prophet, shows up into his, on his doorstep and says, Amaziah, hang on a minute. God gave you this victory. You should be worshiping the one true God, not this false idol. This time, Amaziah does not listen to the prophet. In fact, he starts threatening him. God gave him the victory, yet he worships the wrong God. He's looking at worshiping God as a way of collecting divine favors. If I worship God enough, maybe he'll make my life easy. We don't often worship idols like that, do we? I have been a pastor in a place long enough to see sad stories way too often. Where you walk alongside somebody as they are victorious. And then those victories are forgotten. Because life gets in the way. And the victories are sidelined by life. God, always giving us what we want and what we desire, does not lead to living a victorious Christian life. We need sometimes those defining moments that may take us sometimes into darkness so that we do everything to allow the light to shine in. We need light to shine through. Last couple of evenings I've been uh, getting my Christmas lights up outside. I uh, had to do it over a couple of nights because I realized all the Christmas lights we brought from Viking didn't quite cover the real estate I wanted to do in, in Lamont. So we got some more and I bought a new box of lights, a couple of boxes of new lights, opened them up and all this paper starts falling out with the lights. And one was a little sheet of paper with a warning on it. Everything's got to have a warning label, right? Well, this was a little quarter size piece of paper which said this. Only use these lights indoors or outdoors. I'm covered. No problem. It's true of light, isn't it? We need it everywhere all the time. This prophet comes along to Amaziah. He's listened to him the first time he's come. He's won the victory in the past, and now all he can do is threaten the prophet. Amaziah starts by following scripture, but there's something in their day about worshiping their enemies' gods that just stroked their egos. Look how I have it all together. I win victories. And I'm going to tell you the moment that the idea you are smarter or wiser or more ethical or more together than others, that is the moment you are a threat to a downfall. We do not need to feed our pride. Pride leads to us being like Esau, Not really needing the blessing of God because I've got it together. We have a internal debate in our house of when the Christmas tree should go up. My daughter Jamie, about a month before Valentine's Day would be right. Yeah, tree barely goes down, she'll go back up again. Zoe, she's a little bit more around Remembrance Day, which is her birthday, somewhere around there. To me, December. Just leave it up for December. She'll go up at the beginning of December, come down right New Year's. 
our mini compromise between Zoe and I is it goes up at the end of Grey Cup. We don't have a Grey Cup this year. Does that mean we don't get a Christmas tree in our house? I'm going to tell you this is the year we probably need the tree the most. Because this dark year of COVID, we need to be reminded of light all the more. Many forget they need light. We tend to think of ourselves, hey, I'm a good Christian compared to the rest of the world. We get busy in life, even busy in faith things. And forget our need for a Savior. We don't just need a moment of salvation. Not a moment of salvation do we need a Savior. We need to be reliant on our Savior every day. Wanting Him, surrendering to His Holy Spirit, living knowing that I am not good enough, but Jesus is. The story of Amaziah reminds me of Solomon, a little bit early in the, earlier in the story of Israel, one of his ancestors, who was the wise man who was the good king, who started marrying a whole bunch of foreign wives, including some of the daughters of Esau. And because he knew he was better, he started worshiping their gods. And God started to send problems. In fact, he says the big problem he sent was the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, started to give him problems on his southern boundary. And it was all to call him back to relying on a savior. Solomon, wise, successful, but he stops needing his Savior. It's not like he says, I don't need Jesus anymore. It's just he starts getting busy with life and he kind of forgets about things. And he becomes his own downfall. Well, leaders who mess up and cannot find their way back is often a theme in the scriptures. We don't worship idols, but there are a lot of other things we worship. Perhaps in our lives, a very subtle love of money starts to grow and suddenly, I don't have time or energy for the things of God. Or perhaps there's sexual sin. Never thought I could blow it in this way. I never thought that would be a struggle for me. But then suddenly you spend time with somebody else and emotions start to rise. There's one that I see as a very common way people trip up. Often someone says or does something that offends me and I can't get past the hurt. There's a lack of forgiveness and I'm sorry I've seen this way too many times in the church where something happened that offends me. Do you know what? Lack of forgiveness is a sin that gets emphasized in Scripture. Amaziah, Solomon for that matter, sad to say many others who win victories, but in their pride can no longer see themselves as sinners and therefore are no longer captivated by their Savior. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12 says this, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. Think you got together? That's the moment you need to be on guard. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. This is not written to the world. This is written to the church. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. How about that, calling God a liar? i to be honest, all of us, all of us are in danger of the fall. We have a solution. Aren't you glad for that? James chapter 4, verses 6 to 10. God opposes the proud but gives grace to 
the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. We take sin and salvation as serious matters continually in our lives. Then we will have full security in an eternal God. Any one of us can become entranced with the darkness and not even realize we're missing the light. But God is gracious. And when it's we realize our absolute need for him, those defining moments end up bringing glory. And then, as we change, he can change the world. Light breaks through in our lives. And as we humbly stand before the light every day, the glory of God shines through his church. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you that the goodness and hope and light of Jesus are absolute. Father, teach us to live in the light and to look at the light always. We thank you for the grace and mercy of Jesus. And today as we begin Advent, help us to humbly acknowledge that, yes, we are sinners in need of a Savior. And to continually open us up to the Holy Spirit to fill us, to empower us, to change us. Thank you for all that we have. Thank you for your salvation. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your might. And we pray this in the holy name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us through this morning's service. We're welcome to give me a call at any point as I try to get to know people during what might be a little bit more of an isolated time again. Do feel free. Just give me a call. And I'd love to chat with you. Know that Jesus loves you and he is the light breaking into the darkness. As a final kind of prayer slash benediction, I want to read from Psalm 43, verse 4, that says this. Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Amen. And God bless.